Welcome to The Engineering Room, a monthly series of long-form conversations with influential people from the software world. The Engineering Room series is sponsored by Equal Experts, and I'd like to thank them for their ongoing support. So if you'd like some help building some great software or are interested in finding a great place to work, do check their links in the description below. I first met today's guest when I interviewed him for a job at ThoughtWorks. Uh, where, where we ended up working together on one of the world's biggest agile projects for its day. This was early in his career at ThoughtWorks and the project was one that I think of as one of the birthplaces of continuous delivery. L uh, later he moved on to another of those CD foundational projects where he learned another bunch of important lessons that informed all of our thinking. Later we worked on a book together called Continuous Delivery. That was surprisingly, to us at least, very successful, and I suppose has had a significant impact on both of our lives ever since. Since then, he's moved on to contribute several other things that have had a huge impact on our industry. Not least the books Lean Enterprise, the DevOps Handbook, and Accelerate, as well as founding the Dora company that did much of the research that I quote all of the time and is the source of the now pretty much industry standard metrics for software projects. Dora is now part of Google, and this is where he now works as a site reliability engineer at Google Cloud and a lecturer at UC Berkeley too. Please welcome my ex-colleague, friend, and co-author, Jez Humble. Hi, Jez. Hi, Dave. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, wow, yeah, I, I just remembered that you interviewed me. That was amazing. <laughs> what, a, what a ride it's been. <laughs> it's been crazy. As we were just talking about beforehand, you know, I think as part of their role, we've, we, we've, we've moved the industry a little bit between us. And I don't think either of us thought about that when we were sat in a room somewhere in London. <laughs> Definitely not. I was probably breaking myself a bit. So what was actually going on here? <laughs> cool. Well, it's, it's an absolute delight to see you. Uh, it's been a little while since our paths crossed. So, so we, we, we spent quite a lot of time before we started on this, just rattling off and, uh, and catching up a little bit. I, 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 a good place to start. There is so much stuff that you and I could talk about, I think, but, but maybe one of the places to start. What's your memory of the impetus for Continuous Delivery Book? What led you to wanting to write it? So the way it started off, I think, is um, I was working on one of those projects you talked about earlier. Uh, with Dan North and Chris yeah. Rees and Dante Bryonis and uh, Ben Wyeth and uh, probably a, a, a few other, well, definitely a lot of other people. Sam Neum was on that project as well, although I wasn't yeah. in, in his team. Um, and uh, that was a real pressure cooker. I mean, partly because we were in a tiny little room trying to make this software work on a, that had been written on Windows laptops and was going to be deployed to a Solaris cluster. Yeah. Um, and, and that was a, always a good nightmare. start. Always good. Yeah. I mean, Java's <laughs> Java's platform independent. What could go wrong? right? Um, and uh, off the back of that, we write a paper that we took to the Agile conference. Uh, must have been like 2005 or something like that, I guess, or 2006, yeah. maybe. Um, and we presented that paper. That was me and Chris Reed and Dan North. Um, yeah. Chris Reed was on that project as well. And uh, sometime afterwards, I think Martin Fowler was there and he introduced me to his publisher and said, I think you should give these guys a book contract, um, <laughs> which was pretty, uh, you know, for me at the time, I was like, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and so I just started writing it. And I think really what, what drove me and what's driven me ever since is being really annoyed um, that people are doing things wrong. Um, not not other people. <laughs> not not that you're opinionated or anything. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, anyone who knows me knows that I like a little rant. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, for, for example, um, having to, I, I'm basic, I'm fundamentally quite a lazy person in, in many ways. So the fact that I had to go in over the weekend to do the first release on that project, yeah. that really pissed me off. And yeah. I think, you know, you shouldn't have to do that. So uh, uh, what annoys me is, is waste and people's time being wasted and people having a bad time. Um, you know, all these things which impact quality of life fundamentally. Yeah. I think, you know, there, there's so much waste and stupidity in this industry. And that's what annoys me. And I, yeah. I, I want to get rid of that. And I, I say this when I give a talk, you know, I ask people to put up their hands if they're still doing releases in evenings or weekends. 
Yeah. Um, and I'm like, well, that means, you know, we failed writing the continuous delivery yeah. book. That was my goal. My goal was that yeah. no one should have to do releases their evenings and weekends. That should that should go away. And all the stress and 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 kind of unnecessary stress and um and pain of, of, of the software delivery process should should go away. That that really was what drove me and still drives me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ab- absolutely. I I I I remember. It was before I met you, before I worked at ThoughtWorks, but, but working on a project and spend standing up for most of a weekend in a, um, a data room in in a in a bank, deploying software because we weren't allowed to <laughs> to have access to the to the, to the servers in the data room and we weren't allowed to automate the delivery or anything. And I and I was thinking, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's just crazy, and 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 still, it, uh, you're 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 right. I, I mean, I I think I think that the continuous deliveries and ideas kind of been important to to both of our careers since, but 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 it's deeply important, and and, and it's still not widely practiced. It's still uh, it's still it's still a revelation to lots of people when they see it and I, and i i certainly think that one of the problems of our industry is that there's a large portion of people that work in it that haven't really seen what good looks like and that's a scary idea i think yeah i think that's absolutely right and it's it's funny the extent to which the industry is so siloed and yeah. people can work and have a whole career of working in a particular way and not even realize that there's a different way of working that's possible. And I think, you know, probably the hot button issue for me is still, after all these years, continuous integration, where yes. people honestly think that, you know, it's better to work off in a branch, in a long lived yes. branch, and then integrate that after they're done on their branch. And yes. people will, people get really like personally attacked if you yes. suggest that that's not the best way to, to work and actually, integrating into a shared trunk or mainline multiple times a day even on big teams not only does it work it's better like people yes. feel personally attacked by this and, and get really freaked out and in general whenever i present this idea and i'm sure it must be the same for you you can basically divide the audience into two halves there's one half of people who think that it's impossible and and, and can't you know we can't be serious and then the other yeah. half of the audience is like well obviously why wouldn't you do that and it yeah. is st- Day, a hot button issue which is extraordinary yeah I, uh, exactly and and i i you know I'm, one of the things that i'm interested in and, and interested in talking about with you today is you know the the, the kind of intri- engineering principles that allow you know they kind of guarantee that we'll end up doing a better job if we follow these principles we will get a better result it might not succeed whatever it is that we're trying to do we we, we may still fail because it's engineering not magic but we're going to have we're going to improve we are what whatever it is that we're trying to do we have a better chance of success if we do those things continuous integration i don't understand how anybody can argue against it really because it's the only way in which we can actually evaluate the truth of our system by bringing it together and saying that's the truth of our system let's test that out and I I, I I I agree with you entirely. I have the same experience, and not, and, and I'm I am arguing with people uh, on social media quite a lot these days, but but also occasionally in person um, about on that topic all of the time. And as you say, I think it's it's probably the most emotive topic, which which is surprising because it seems I don't quite understand why people are quite so wedded to it. I, I have a theory about this. And my theory is that it's actually very much tied to the identity of what it means to be a software developer. And yeah. this idea that, um, you know, what a software developer, if, if you could do whatever you wanted as a software developer, what that would be would to be to sit in your room with your headphones on for yeah. days and days, just hacking away without, you yeah. know, talking to anyone, without eating properly, without getting any fresh air or anything like that. And that that is, you know, the the acme of what it means to to really be a software developer. And, yeah. and any extent to which you're working on a team or working with other people or having to talk to people somehow detracts from that pure essence of what it is to be a software developer. Yeah. And I think, you know, that, you know, my, the other thing that, you know, as you know, if you as you know me, and, and I, I've talked about this a lot, like that's very much tied to like a lot of things that I also care about in the industry, like the gender imbalance and the yeah. 
imbalance in along race lines and other things um that that identity is you know very much a kind of a duty thing to to have as an idea of, of what yeah. it means um and so that's why i think it's kind of an identity thing for people and i think you know something someone said on twitter ages ago that really struck me was that a lot of the xp principles were basically fighting against that kind of identity and saying well actually yes. the best way to develop software is to work as a team and talk to each other a lot more yes. and software version control is fundamentally a communication tool it's how you tell other people what you're doing yeah. and so what you're doing with continuous integration is like communicating a lot more with other people and talking to them and this idea that you know i'm not done i'm not even i can't even evaluate the extent to which i'm done until i'm integrated and to yeah. do that i need to know what other people are doing and that what i'm doing works with other people and to do that a lot more often like a lot of these xp principles are actually about building teams that are not based on that idea that you're just that, that software development is primarily about sitting with your headphones on knocking out code yeah 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 hollywood and the tv industry's got a lot to answer for <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely no i i i i, I do think you're right the the the, the other the other thing that it seems to me that's deeply challenging to to people, and and challenges them to the degree to which they get defensive and you know combative and those sorts of things as well, I think, is is the idea of of working in small steps and working more incrementally. A lot of people seem to think, often the same people that 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 that, that you're talking about, but they seem to think that the job is to sit there and be really brilliant and to have genius just jump from their heads in one one big step. And I don't think it works like that at all. I, I am I make mistakes all of the time. I type the wrong things. I can't remember bits of you know the libraries that I'm using or whatever. And so I want the tiny little bit of feedback, the tiny little juice of feedback that after every tiny little step, I know that things are working. I've said this a few times recently in, in, in different contexts, but, but if I think of the... I've been very fortunate to w work with some people that I think are genuinely great software developers. And I can't... It's really hard to kind of put your finger on what it is that's great about them. But the one thing, the one characteristic that I can... Actually, two characteristics that I can that I can think of that, that that they all share is one of them that you were just talking about. They talk to people, they talk to people a lot, and the other one is that they work in tiny steps. And after each tiny step, they say, "Is it still working?" <laughs> Not necessarily in a TDD context, or that's my preference, but just in general, you know, they they always worked like that even before they did TDD or whatever whatever else. So I. I, I I agree with you. I, I I think I think these are misleading ideas. Yeah, and I think um, you know sometimes I think that also comes from a place of insecurity that you feel you've got to prove yeah. yourself. And by 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 kind of going off and creating this amazing thing and and delivering it as if it was as you say, kind of from from the mind of Zeus, somehow yeah. shows you to be like this this brilliant person. And I think you know what one of the things that you know as I've grown in my career and and you know. I, I'm in this place that I feel very lucky to be in where, you know, I'm kind of, you know, looked up to by a certain group of people and that, you know, uh, not that I haven't worked for that, but, um, you know, it is that I can now just be much more open about the fact that, yeah. as you say, like I make mistakes all the time. I Google stuff all the time. And, you know, when I'm teaching yeah. in UC Berkeley, I make a point of saying, oh, I can't remember what this is. You know, even though I'm teaching a class in, you know, Java, yeah. I'll still Google stuff during class that I can't yeah. remember because, you know, it, it's actually your job as a software engineer is not to be a, a, a Wikipedia. It's to, yeah. to, so, to, pro, to solve problems. And when you solve problems, the whole point of solving problems is that they haven't been solved before. Because otherwise, why are you getting paid for it? So, of course, you're not going to know the answer <laughs> straight away. Because if you knew the Absolutely. answer straight away, it wouldn't be a problem worth solving. Yeah, 100%. And, and I, I, I am... I am constitutionally lured to the hard problems i i love it when people say oh we've got a hard problem we don't know what to do i'm going oh cool <laughs> let me let me at it because 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 that's the job you you want it you want to try you want to try and be challenged a little bit and you you want to be trying out you know you know exercising the muscles to 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 explore the problem but but that's deeply about having the tools of the trade the techniques that allow you the opportunities to learn and 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 know how to start to walk into a problem where you've no clue what the answer is. 
Right. And, and the answer is not going to be, I'm going to go away and just yes. solve it by yes. myself over <laughs> yes. the course of days or weeks or months. Like we're not doing theoretical physics where, where that <laughs> might be. And, and even then, you know, people talk about Einstein going away and solving general relativity. Well, that's, that's, you know, that's true. That was mainly him. But, yeah. you know, he was talking to people all the time and going to conferences yeah. and reading papers. And there was all this stuff going on. It wasn't he wasn't operating in a yeah. in a vacuum. Um, yeah. And so I think, you know, it's it's the same. Uh, and, and that thing that you talk about, about being iterative, um, mm -hmm. that's key to problem solving. You yes. know, you're not going to come up with a complete solution as a hypothesis. Like what I always do all the time is like, OK, what's step one? You know, and how can yeah. I go and test that and validate that? and come back yeah. with that thing and what's step two and that's actually the hard bit is taking that big yeah. thing splitting up into you know what's step one how can i test that and then in the price of learning that that will change probably you know at least some part of the picture of what the problem is that you have to solve it and it might completely shift it in in some cases yes um, but that's essential you know it's like you know i was watching the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy with my daughter last night and uh you know it's like you go to you go to talk to deep thought and deep thought says well the answer's 42 yeah. you know and it's, it's because <laughs> you fundamentally failed at the problem of asking questions you know yes Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Asking the good questions is is definitely part of what what it takes to be good at this job, I think. But but I, I mean, in, in, you know, in, in, in the trivial way, but also in the deep way of just of just coming up with those little questions that we want to ask of our software and the process and each other and all of those things to drive the learning. The, 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 I, 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 I think I think I know that both of us are proud of the impact that we've had with our work with continuous delivery and and I, I, I believe that you share my view that very strongly I believe that in all of these years later after we published our book um, it's still state of the art it's still you know if you want to be great at software development then this is the way to be be great at it. It seems to me it doesn't seem much argument. First, do you agree with that? And, and what is it that you think that continuous delivery brings to this picture that we've been painting and helps with to to to, to hold that position? Yeah, I mean, it is uh, obviously I'm very likely to be subject to confirmation bias here. But yeah, me too. I will say, <laughs> <laughs> but I will say that I don't think there's anything we wrote in the continuous delivery book that's substantive that's actually wrong. Um, yeah. I think it's all stood the test of time. Um, the DevOps movement um, has been incredibly successful, and continuous delivery is is a big part of that. Although, you know, I will say I think a lot of people independently came up with the same idea. So I yeah, know yeah, yeah. that um, that it's it's not you know. I'm, I'm, I know you're not going to disagree with me, but I think it still is worth saying that, you know, there's a lot of other people who contributed to this and, and came up with with similar ideas. And, and you know, I, I know that, you know, um, and, and, and agree with me that, you know, a lot of this came from XP and and, and Agile. Yeah. Um, so we, we kind of both of us built on the on the shoulders of giants in that respect. But, yeah, like it's I think it's all it's all right. And uh, the research program that Dora, um, Nicole Forsgren, my co-founder and the CEO of Dora, and the chief scientist, she did all the kind of scientific um, part of that. Um, uh, she that that has really demonstrated it to be true. And I know both of us have worked in so many different industries and with so many people. Um, and, and this stuff works. It just does. Yeah. It makes things better. It makes software um, more reliable. It makes it higher quality. It makes you faster at delivering it. Um, and it's just a, a better way of working. Um, so that's incredibly gratifying to have been part of that story. I think. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and absolutely, you're 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 right. It, it, it's not that we invented this way of working. I I, I think we gave it. We 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 helped apply a language to it and pulled some thoughts together, but they weren't all our thoughts. That's, in, in the early days of the book, I remember. I remember we started off quite a few of the people that you mentioned earlier that were on your team and and a couple of others. We planned for the book to be a bit of a, a, a collection of essays from all of us, and you and me were the only ones that did any writing. <laughs> we were the only ones left standing at the end. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, originally, I, I remember I was, I was writing it with a couple of other people, and, and then I found out you were writing a, a book on the same topic. Yeah. And then we kind of we kind of pinged each other and worked out 
uh, and kind of it was early enough along that we were able to combine forces and uh, yeah and yeah but I also remember when it came out you know I got a, some someone who's a friend of Eric Reese was really outraged that we'd released a book on this topic when Eric mm-hmm. Reese had been talking about this and Tim Fitz as well who wrote the continuous yeah. deployment blog post and yeah. uh and yeah it was just clear that a lot of other people had had similar thoughts and were moving in a yeah, similar yeah. direction yeah I, I i i i often talk about continuous delivery as an approach as being kind of gen 2 extreme programming so so i think that one of the things one of the things that from our context the thought you know the the thought works context of of that part of the story it seems to me that what thoughtworks was doing was was doing extreme programming on a bigger scale than it was normal for extreme programming at the time so we were kind of pushing at the boundaries and find you know finding the squeaky parts of the you know that it was it was a little bit hard to deal with so so i think that we you know we we just i don't think there was anything that was wrong with extreme programming it's just that we kind of talked about that bigger picture of doing it on different scales maybe in uh, in different circumstances yeah i mean i remember that when we got the jolt award uh, i remember there was a the the review of the book that was part of the jolt awards judging yeah. process basically said that you know we just took all these problems that people thought were incredibly hard and just were like and this is how you solve it and i think yeah. that that for me was what we were able to, I mean, I mean, in, and in my case, because I was too young to know any better, I think, um, was just that, you know, these were all solvable problems. Yeah. And if you just took a kind of methodical, systematic approach and a, a bit of creativity, um, these were all soluble problems. And I, and one of my favorite examples of that was blue green deployments, which uh, yes. I think actually Dan North was, was the guy who came up with that idea. Um, you can correct yeah. me if I'm wrong about that, but this idea that, you know, we had this, these Solaris boxes that we were talking about, and uh, it was a weekend long release process. And he was just, he just had had this idea. He was like, well, why don't we install the next version in production at the same time? And we were all like, yeah. what are you talking about, Dan? And he said, well, listen, we can just stand up the entire stack on a different place in the file system, listening on a different ports yeah. on the same computer. And yeah. uh, and that's what we did. We basically you know, installed WebLogic twice on different places in the file. I mean, and we had to like, the installer wouldn't do that for you. So what we did is we we, we we ran the installer on an empty Linux box and then diffed the file system after the installer had run and reverse yeah. engineered what it did and checked all the files into CVS and basically installed by checking out of CVS into a particular place on the file system. And then just having variables that we inserted um, using a bash script for what ports it was listening on and all the other things that were changed between the two yeah installs of that and then doing the same thing for apache um and, and and all the other parts of the stack so basically you know you had your production system running on one install and then you deployed the next version to the other install that you had and and you could basically you know smoke test that and then release was just pointing the load balancer at the front ends to the new installs ports versus the old install ports and then you know rolling back was just changing the load balancer back to the other set of ports. And then your new live version, um, you know, your old live version becomes your staging version to deploy your next yeah. install to. And, you know, we weren't using Terraform or containers or any of this crap. We were just using Linux and CVS and, you know, some some kind of smart ideas about um, h- how you can get things working. And that for me is the essence of continuous delivery. It's just problem solving. Um, yes, I I, th- I think going back to something that you said earlier, which kind of resonated with me, and the way that quite quite a lot of the way that I think about continuous delivery, it's applying the kind of problem solving that good software developers apply to solving software development problems to software development. <laughs> it's the same. It's just it's turtles all the way down really it's 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 just it's just been able to apply that kind of logical engineering style of reasoning of solving the problems going through trying stuff out see what works make progress in small steps i i, I remember i remember i was i was i was playing slight interference uh, uh, for, for with with the client as i recall for, for, some, for some of the, the stuff of the project that you were talking about and i, I remember coming in at some point to, to there and and, and and you and your team and dan being excitedly tell, telling me that you'd been able to deploy using this technique 
Um, I think it was some something like four, somewhere between four and six hours it was taking you to to to, to prep the you know to deploy the software, and you said. We just it just took us two seconds to switch over <laughs> with, with the blue with the blue green deployment and been absolutely delighted and, and way way fewer problems as a result of the strategy. Yeah, it was it was huge, and I still get people coming up to me saying that like that that technique has changed, you know, meant yeah. that they don't have to go in evenings and weekends anymore. Yeah. So uh, you know, and, and 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 so much of this is is about. I, I would think I've got my science T-shirt on today, so but but I, I I would think of this as kind of the practical application of that kind of thing, science style thinking, of, you know, engineering of just trying to say it's not about my preferences, it's not about what I like or what I don't like, it's about what works, and that's it. And I'm going to try out the stuff that works, and as much as I might like working on a branch with my headphones on, that doesn't work as well, so I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do something else. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, I would obviously be, you know, a bit bummed if someone showed that all the stuff we we're talking about was actually not the best way to do it. But I'd also be happy that people have found a better way of working. And, uh, you know, it's, I remember being blown away by these ideas when I encountered them. Yeah. Um, so it's not like I was born knowing this stuff. It's stuff that I'm I've just like, wow, that I, you know, I remember reading the XP book in 2000. Yeah. When I first started and thinking, well, this is a load of bollocks. <laughs> and, you know, and then two years later, I joined ThoughtWorks and I worked with people who worked in that way. Yeah, and I was like, "Holy crap, this is amazing!" <laughs> yeah, but you know, without that experience, I probably would have continued to think it was a load of bollocks. And so, yeah. you know, I just want to, for me, a, a big part of it is just passing that on and being like, "Yes, you know, I want everyone else to have had that experience." Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Me, yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, and uh, th that's that's a large part of the job satisfaction that I get from my work and the stuff that we, you know, th th that we did with the book and so on. But um, uh, is trying to help people to to see what I think is a better way. And and if it's not a better way, show me where the reasoning's wrong. Show me what works better, and I will thank you for it, and I'll adopt it and talk about it you know so I, i'm not i'm not precious about this I, this is I, I like you you know <laughs> there'll be a little bit of hubris i'll be slightly disappointed if i've got something wrong but i'll also be grateful for learning where i'm wrong because that's what i want to know and that's that's the engineering mindset surely yeah I, I i have a question so so one of the things that that uh, we do on our patreon channel we've got a discord server and we ask people um, to they can submit questions for our guests on the engineering room. So I have a question from Adam Hawkins. Uh, so Jez, what's your mental model for software delivery, and how do you explain it to others? Oh, that's a big question. It um, is. <laughs> uh, I kind of think we've already answered that to an extent. It's I think that we have thing, a bit. That thing of um, working in small steps, treating every step as a hypothesis, yeah. um, designing some tests for that hypothesis uh and and thinking of uh i think nat nat price came up with this thinking of every change is like a transformation of the code base so we're yeah. going to make this transformation whether that's a refactoring or a, a, a new bit of functionality how are we going to test that that transformation achieves the desired results uh, in the case of a refactoring it's by running your test suite and showing that it doesn't cause any problems by a transformation that adds some new functionality writing a test first to uh, validate that that function doesn't exist already and being able to run a test that tells you when it does work as described and working in that very incremental um, way and, and, and gathering data all the time um, yeah. and updating your model based on what you learn um, all the time a, a, as a way of working, even if you already know the answer. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, uh, and just being actually very dogmatic about that. Uh, and um, I, I think the other thing is just being very evidence based about things. Like if you're yes. gonna, if you're gonna build a feature, what are you going to measure that tells you that the feature had the intended impact? Whether that's um, uh, a feature that you're building for your users, what you're going to measure to show that it actually makes life better for them or for your company or for your organization. Yeah. If you're making a performance improvement, what are you going to measure? Like say what the measurement is first that you're going to do, and then actually perform the measurement. Um, yes. And like. That's problematic. Like we're doing some work on my team at Google at the moment to improve the reliability of our services. And, you know, we've got a metric, 
that took us quite a while to implement. But the problem is, you know, the metric is kind of a trailing metric and it's hard to measure okay. cause and effect. But like, so so it's not like it's a magic wand and it, it solves all your problems. There's still issues with it, but at least you can know if you're getting better or worse. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the second order of problem of establishing causality, you know, that's a great problem to have. So I think that that's that for me is is what is at the essence of it. And applying that to delivery is about, you know, fundamentally going from a state where nothing's working until you prove that it is to being yes. in a state where everything's working. And the moment it moves away from that, you find out straight away and you can fix it straight away so that your system is always in a deliverable state. Yeah. That that for me is the essence of, of kind of continuous delivery. And you can apply that everywhere. You can apply that yeah. as you know, as you have done um, and I have done over the last, you know, God, 13 years since the book was out. Um, you know, that applies if you're doing firmware, if you're doing uh, software as a service, if you're doing mainframes, it applies everywhere. And we, between us, I think we've probably applied it anywhere uh, yeah. in, in yeah. any domain that anyone can care to uh, to bring up. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so what Jez said was work experimentally and... <laughs> and work in small steps uh, and it, you, you optimize for feedback <laughs> it's, absolutely so, you know it's it's I, 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 I and I, I think one of I think one of the ideas that I that I've, I, I, I talk about a lot these days is that, that I, I think is important but that it took it took me a while to I think it's hard sometimes to see what it is that you're doing you know, to introspect and understand what it is that's that you're doing that's working. But I think that one of the things that I recognise in the way that I tend to approach uh, problems is working so 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 that my software is always changeable. So so making it easy to change. So so it's one of the themes of you know my recent work is that I think that the only definition for quality in software that makes any sense at all is that that. Quality is defined by the ease with which we change things because the alternative is that whatever else that it is that we want, yes, it has to be scalable, yes, it has to be resilient, yes, it has to be secure, all of those other things. But the only way that we get those things if we can't change the software is by being perfect the first time. So, so, so the marker of quality for me is that the, what you said about that ability to just try stuff out and learn from it and change things all of the time. And so working in a way so it's easy to do that, which, which also plays into the continuous delivery. Continuous delivery deeply makes that easier, I think, is, is almost the whole game. It's not the whole game because we've got to solve pe problems for people, problems that matter for people. But um, in terms of the engineering process, the, 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 the techniques and, uh, and, and approaches that we use to, to, do, to, to, to deliver the software, it seems that that's, that's hugely part of it to me. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the question I sometimes get is, you know, are there any cases where they, this doesn't apply? And I think there are. I mean, if you look at the early days of software development, it was mainly for the military and it was mainly for one off things that when you built it, you were never going to change it. So, mm -hmm. for example, you know, the ICBMs were and an ICPM defense systems were one of the first applications of software engineering um, after the Apollo missions, I think. Um, and so, you know, once you built an ICBM, you probably don't want to change it. And mm -hmm. so it was very much about getting it right the first time. And they weren't making continuous upgrades to that. Um, but for most of the software we build today, it's about product development. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're taking a project mindset when you build it and then it's done, it doesn't make as much sense. Although you can still apply and use these techniques. Yeah. Um, famously, they were used by the teams that were working on you know, the space shuttle program and, and yeah. so forth. Um, but that's not what we're mainly doing. Anytime you're building something and you expect that it will evolve in the course of its life cycle, because you're going to build something and, and you know, for a product, that's that's what success is, is that yeah. it'll continue to evolve over the course of its life cycle. That's where this approach is really essential. Yeah. Not to say you can't use it in other areas, but you know, we're we're generally not building something where we're getting all the money up front and once we deliver it, we'll never have to change it. That yeah. you know, it might make less sense to work in this way, but but, but, but uh, yeah, so, so 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 unusually, I think there might be slight difference in our opinions there because I I think I think even even then, even if you are building the ICBM and it's you know it's it's this one big project, you might not have to go back and change it in the future. But while 
I still think that while you're actually building it for the first time, it's still a process of evolution. It's still a process of evolution of your understanding and, and refine, you know, refinement of the code. I, I, I have worked on a few waterfall projects in the past, a long time ago, and all of them, it seems to me, only worked because people cheated the process because the process didn't help. So, so, and and one of the other one of the other delightful facts that I, that I, that I absolutely love was that um, the the flight control software for the Mercury program, which predated Apollo by several series of, of spacecraft, was was written was written using test driven development. I didn't and, know that. So tell me yeah. more. So, so, so they practiced test driven development on the software, while while NASA didn't think that you know software was engineering or any important anyway. So, the, so the software developers had the process. So they, they were doing. I think they were also doing what was call, called around then spiral development. But certainly, test driven development was part of the approach that they did. So they built built things and tested them in simulation on you know on these ancient computers you know, that that weren't even as powerful as your, your Apple Watch. You know, but um, but they but 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 they they were using test driven development. So and then we forgot it. Test driven development was reinvented in 1968 by Alan Perlis, and then we forgot it again. And then it was reinvented again in 1990 something by by Kent Beck. So so that's a cool I, story. I actually I have I have a Mer there's a Mercury capsule um, a, a museum. You know about yeah. 30 minutes away from where I live, from where cool. I live. So I've got, I've got to sit in a Mercury capsule, which is which is amazing. It's one awesome. of those things where I took the kids, and the kids yeah. were like, "This is shit," and I got in. And I was really excited. <laughs> <laughs> my 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 brother in laws my brother in laws for my brother in laws fiftieth birthday, which was the last time there was an eclipse in the states, I think, as far as I know. We we did a pilgrimage to NASA sites. <laughs> we drove all around and visited lots of different NASA sites. We we're both nerds. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I, I got to go to um, the Kennedy Space Center in uh, yeah, yeah. in Florida and and walk under um, uh, one of the Atlas rockets. And again, it was one of yeah. those things where I was really excited, and my kids just yeah. couldn't couldn't have been. I mean, they were very young at the time, so they were more interested in getting popsicles at the end. But um, yeah. yeah, and I think you know, to, to your point, I'm not saying I I think I'm not saying that you shouldn't still work in this way. I think you should. I'm just saying, like that. That's probably the the only case you could make for not working yeah. in this way. But even there, I agree with you that it's I, you're, you're I, more likely I, I, to succeed if you do yeah. it in that iterative, incremental way. I, 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 I think I actually I don't think human beings do. Essentially, anything that we do that's complex is a process of of kind of guided evolution, and you know that is what design and experimentation and and, and engineering of any form really really is about. I was, Certainly, aviation, which is another subject that I, that I know a little bit about, the evolution of the aircraft was deeply incremental on a very slow scale. You know, it, it took centuries. It took a century to get to really seriously safe aeroplanes. But now, you know, we are safer in an aeroplane than you and I are sit here, sat here. So, so I, I yeah, but yeah, especially but, one mile from a from the Hayward Fault. That's definitely true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, so, I remember like, sorry, I mean, just one, one no, more no, thing no. I want to say about that, because you've drugged my memory, is that yeah. I, I did a, I gave a talk in, in like 20, 2011 or something about this. And I remember um, visiting the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona yeah. and uh, going down to the crypt. And, you know, people people talk about, you know, wouldn't wouldn't it be better if software was more like, uh, you know, physical engineering where you build yeah. something and it just stays up instead of breaking all the time. And I remember going down to the crypt and and, and Gaudi was like, you know, very unusual guy. He 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 mm. invented this idea of using hyperbolic curves in in structures, which are used in the Sagrada Familia and, and other buildings that he he built. And obviously, that was completely new as a technique. Um, and and he was very test driven about that. You go down into yes. the crypts, and you can see he's got these upside down kind of mock ups of the building with weights to simulate the forces that would be applied by gravity on the structures. Yes. And he's come up with all these clever ways to kind of test. His hypotheses about how to build these things and, and he's taken a very tests. right and he's taken this very <laughs> incremental like um test driven approach to to building these structures so yeah. you know i think any any time as you say you're doing anything which is um uh, an innovation where you you don't know how to do it you're gonna yeah. you're gonna want to take this 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 approach 
And as you said, I mean, I mean, I, I, one of one of my themes in my engineering talk is that it, it is software has a, digital assets have a really unique property, which is that the cost of production is free, essentially. You know, we can just clone the the sequence of bytes for essentially zero cost. So we're always doing something new. We're always in, in software development, unlike other things. You know, perhaps more than other things, but but we are always doing new something new. So these techniques are even more important, perhaps, um, for, for those things. Oh, I, well, I, I think I think this is reminding me of a presentation that you did a few years ago which I don't think I've ever mentioned to you, but I absolutely loved that you did because it resonated so closely with, with the stuff. And it was, it was um, continuous delivery won't work here. And you listed all of the reasons why it won't work. And, and basically my recollection is that you summed it up as your technology is crap, your organization is crap, or your people are crap is what you're saying. You know, and none of it, you know, so, so fix those things. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, what I, yeah, I said either your architecture is crap or your culture is crap. And uh, yeah. I, I, Actually, your people are crap is one of the reasons I said that executives give for why yes. they can't do continuous delivery. But yes. actually, most of the time, the people who are crap in that situation are the executives. Uh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. absolutely. Because they don't they don't trust their people and they don't give their people the uh, authority and, and tools and support to, to try new ways of working. I, I, were you uh, this is a, this is a silly question, probably, given how huge Google is. But were you at all involved with the. Uh, the, the research was it? Is it? Oh, I forgot the name of the project now. But the project, oh, project Aristotle. Around, Aristotle. They, yeah, Project Aristotle. I was going to say Aristotle, but I thought I was wrong. But. Yeah, no, that was, that was before my time. Um, okay. But it was very gratifying. Um, yeah. So any anyone who's who's watching who's not heard of it, it was basically Google's attempts to work out how to build high performing teams at Google. And you know, everyone thought it was you know hire a bunch of Stanford grads, fire all the managers, and and build everything in uh, you know Go or C plus plus or whatever. Um, and what they found, actually, which is very interesting, was that what what you need primarily is um, psychological safety and, and the ability of treat teams, people in teams to trust each other and rely on each other uh, yeah. and feel comfortable taking risks. Um, and then also, I think there's five things. Thing number two was um, that you can rely on people to do what they say and uh, and, and the, the roles and responsibilities are clearly defined. And uh it was interesting that the Dora research, we were able to more or less replicate that result um, yeah. by studying something completely different, uh, which was, well, which we thought was completely different, which was um, Westrom's model of culture, yes. where he looks at safety culture and how to build a, a, a culture um, in which uh, you can build safe, safe systems in, in safety critical industries like uh, healthcare and nuclear yeah. and, and aviation and he, he kind of built this typology which talks about a bunch of things and, and we, we actually show statistically that they're measuring the same thing um mm -hmm. which was really fascinating so we basically replicated it through it through a different path but it shows that the, the same thing is is critical um so yeah that that was that was super fun but yeah i wasn't involved in aristotle but it's always nice when you can replicate someone else's research yeah 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 I, 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 the other thing that the, the other thing that that reminded me of you, you, um uh, you talked about the western model but also the belbin stuff from the 1960s in terms of the structure of teams so he talked about different types of people. so you you don't make a great team by having all you know all geniuses together because they just fight all the time so you know you, you have to you have to have different kinds of people with different characteristics and he, he he came up with a bunch of i think it was five different types of characteristics that people had that that you and you need to bring to great 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 team you need to bring them together but it reminded when i read the google research it reminded me of that and i think that they i think that they hooked up after they realized they joined it up some somewhat but anyway so um so so so, so another another um, Patreon question. Django asks, have you ever had trouble? I, I think I know the answer to this one already. Have you ever had trouble convincing management that the iron tri triangle does not hold true in software? <laughs> Do you have any anecdotes for this? Uh, yeah, I mean, all, all the time, I think. Um, because it, those are often your incentives and how you're measured. You know, so you're like, well, you got, I mean, I've never been on a project that was important that didn't have some kind of schedule pressure. Yeah. And and so you've always got that pressure. There's always too much work and not enough people to do it. Um, you know, you 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 
cost is always an issue. People are always trying to reduce costs. And then obviously people care about it working at the end of it. So, you know, that those are those are the things that you care about. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the way this manifests itself all the time is, you know, the developers will say, well, look, our code base is a piece of shit. We really need to fix it. And the managers and the product people or the customers, uh, even if those customers are like the line of business um, in, in your own company, just saying, well, listen, you know, that's, that's great. We haven't got time to do that because we've got to deliver these features. And, yes. and and fundamentally, it's just very easy to get caught in that trap. And I think part of it, honestly, is engineers being too honest about this. I, I, I always remember Gary Groover talking about his work when he was director of engineering for the LaserJet firmware team. Yeah. Um, and they implemented continuous delivery for HP LaserJet firmware, um, which was a huge team. That was like 400 people distributed across three different countries. Um, and they they basically completely re-architected the system so they could implement continuous integration and test automation and, and all these things that we talked about. Um, and, you know, it, one of the results that was very interesting about that is he, he looked at what people were working on. Like how are people spending their time? And he found that, you know, a lot of the time was spent on um, support, which is a mm-hmm. nice proxy variable for quality, and also just, you know, moving code between branches and, and manual work. And then they completely re-engineered the whole system, built it from the ground up to support test automation and continuous integration. And then there was much less time spent on all these manual things. Yeah. And there was, you know, there were 5% originally of the time was spent building features. Yeah. And at the end of this process, 40% of the time was built spending spent building features and so it was like an 8x improvement in productivity which was amazing and then at the end of it if you look at all the numbers it doesn't add up to 100 percent yeah and what you find is that actually i can't remember the exact number off the top of my head but it's something like 30 35 percent of the time is spent uh it's between 20 and 35 percent of the time is spent building and maintaining automated acceptance tests yeah and so I sw- and I say to people, you know, what what would you say if you went to your manager and said, please, can we have 30 percent of our budget for test yeah. automation? Yeah. And they would basically tell you to get stuffed. Yeah. But it's it's because it's you think, well, it, I, I can't it, I've got this capacity pool and I'm adding to it. Yeah. And what it's really hard, I think, to to get into people's head is that actually we're reducing the amount of time you're going to spend on these things. And people just don't believe it. And I think that's probably a cognitive bias that people have that, you know, you can't believe that actually it's going to really make things better. Is it really going to make things better? And and so, uh, you know, it's just a human psychological thing. I think. I I, I like, I like the way that Gary in in his book and the laser jet team, you know, enumerated that the, 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 the way that they were doing the work uh, and 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 to, in order to make that point, to to, to visualise it, going back to what you were saying before, you know, to gather some evidence really about about the impact of the choices. It's a really good book. I'll I'll put a link in the description to the video um, for for people to look at. This starts getting us into in, into kind of thinking in terms of data and your work with Nicole and 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 other people uh, to create the Dora metrics and you know, do the state of DevOps report and capture all of that that information. Can you tell us a little bit about your, you know, your take on this? Because, because from my point of view, as far as I know, as far as I can find, it's probably the most justifiable scientific study into the sociology of software development. Yeah, um, it, I mean, I think we've had a, a lot of failures in terms of um, doing research into software engineering. Uh, mainly because it's teams and it's very hard to control the variables when you're doing when you're doing stuff with teams. So you can't really do randomized control trials, mm-hmm. which would be the gold standard. Although, you know, the problem with randomized control trials, randomized controlled trials, is they tell you that something has happened and that there's a causal relationship, but it doesn't tell you why, which yeah. can be quite, you know, frustrating. So in, you know, I've got a friend who's a scientist who works at uh, Lawrence National Labs. And he's always uh, he's always slagging off medicine because he's like, yeah, you've got these randomized control trials that tell you that a drug works, but it doesn't tell you why. Like, there's yeah. no causal mechanism, um, you know. So 
there are drawbacks with that as well. Um, I do, just just to interrupt you, I'm 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 a I'm a popular physics nerd, and and one of the mo the best books that I've ever read is The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch. And Deutsch talks about he's a research physicist at came uh, uh, Oxford, sorry, um, but he he talks about science as a process of finding good explanations for things. And he's very, he has a very specific definition of what a good explanation is. So you can't add anything or take anything away without changing the explanation. It has to be true in the context of all other things. It's a bit like unit tests for facts. <laughs> it's, 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 kind, it's kind of a nice idea. But, um, but, I, but I, 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 you know, I, there's more to science than just... Um, uh, you know, gathering statistics. It's it, it's it's like I was always dissatisfied with quant quantum theory because it it ducked the explanation. You know, it it, it ducked the, the, the trying to explain what was going on. I feel much, whether it's wrong or not, I feel much happier with the multiverse description because at least now I've got a model in my head that I can play examples through. So I, I think it's important in science to be able to do that kind of thing. To, yeah, to build those models, models, models that, that we can try. try. Yeah, no, exactly. And, you know, I actually studied physics and philosophy at college. So yeah. I, I spent a lot of time thinking about these issues. And, you know, it's still something I follow today. Like there's there's there, there's an e-book or I guess a recent-ish book by a guy called uh, Ravelli, who's a pretty famous physicist called Helgoland, which talks about um, uh, another alternative explanation for quantum theory. Um, yeah. You know, so there, there there wasn't a satisfying, a fully satisfying one, I think, when I was studying physics, yeah. uh, which was 95 to 99. And this book by Ravelli is, is really interesting. But, you know, the, the jury's still out. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but but the, the, the shut up and calculate never never resonated with me because physics is surely is about having theories about what we're... Anyway, we're getting off topic. Yeah, but, ex but I, 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 it's about explanations, and I, I think that's important it, it, in software too. It's it goes back to what we were talking about. The difference for me, the difference between feature branching and continuous integration, is that I can give you an explanation as why I think that works for continuous integration. And there's big gaps in feature branching if you try and do the same thing. It seems to me. Yeah. No. Ex exactly. And so, randomized control trials didn't work. How can we study software engineering? And I think the uh, the brilliant insight that um, uh, Nicole Forsgren had um, was to apply behavioral techniques to to this. So obviously, behavioral techniques are a social science technique, and yeah. you know there's a, a lot of kind of rationalist people who like to look down on the social sciences. But as I like to point out, when people do that, you know, behavioral economics won the Nobel Prize, uh, or the, yeah. the people who created behavioral economics won the Nobel Prize. And, and that's how we study cognitive bias. So when yeah. people talk about, oh, you know, there's cognitive biases here, and I'm like, how do you know that? You know that because of behavioral economics, which is based yeah. on behavioral science. Yes. So, uh, you know, there's often a certain circularity to people's discussion of this. Yes. Um, but I think, you know, that that was uh, Nicole's really brilliant move, was to take these techniques uh, from, from behavioral science and apply them to studying um, you know, software, which is fundamentally, as we talked about, a team activity uh, and hence subject to team dynamics and because they're made of people. Um, yeah. And so that just proved to be tremendously successful. And, you know, Nicole had been studying this stuff in the context. I mean, we were very lucky to find Nicole. But the, yeah. for people who don't know, the story behind that was uh, me and Jean Kim worked with Puppet on the State of DevOps report um, from, I think, like 2014. And uh, we were presenting it at PuppetConf uh, and afterwards, this this woman came up to one of the speakers and said, "You know, this is a bit. This is not very rigorous. You could do a better job of this." And uh, and they said, "Well, maybe you should come along and, and show us how to do it." And that that was Nicole. She was a, yeah. a professor at Utah State at the time, um, studying actually uh, systems administration. She has a background in systems administration. She yeah. went to IBM as a sysadmin, and then went into academia and, and studied systems administration as a as a, as a field. Um, and, and so she had this kind of background of researching um, the, the kind of work and what it was like to do the work and uh, and, and the, you know, the and performance and stuff like this. And so she just took that and applied it to this field of DevOps and continuous delivery and, and software delivery performance. Yeah. And, and yeah, it was just, you know, we were very lucky. We got a really big data set. 
She's very rigorous in the way she designed that study. She applied yeah. a very kind of rigorous academic approach to it. And it, and it, and it worked. Um, and it worked year after year. We were able to reproduce this result that, um, you know, if you if you measure these these metrics, um, uh, deploy frequency, lead time, time for a store, change fail rate, um, every time you do cluster analysis, it divides into these groups where there's a group that's really yeah. high performing, a group that's really low performing and something in between. Um, yeah. and, and that there's no reason it should come out like that. It's yeah. just totally the luck of the draw. And every year we'd analyze the results and I'd be kind of holding my breath to find out if the cluster analysis would fall out that way. And it yeah. always did, you know, and, and, and yeah. what it shows is to, to the earlier question, it's not a zero sum game. It's yeah. not an iron triangle. Yeah. These techniques that we talk about, it's not about going fast and breaking things. It's about being very rigorous and disciplined about the way you do software development, which enables you to move faster, safely, and move yes. safely faster. And those uh, two and, things uh, and, uh, there's, there's, there's a few things in there I'd, I'd just call out because I think they're deeply important and revelatory, really. I, 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 there's no trade-off between speed and quality. You guys found the data that demonstrate that that's the case. That allows people like me to have the you know, you know don't cut corners, write great software, <laughs> you know, and you and that's an investment. That's a worthwhile investment because you will go faster if you if your product owner's calling for feature, feature, feature. You say yes, boss. What that means is that we need to test more and 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 and, and optimize feedback and make sure that we're 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 getting faster feedback so that we can learn learn more effectively because that's how you. That's how you build. That's how you go faster. It's not. It's not over. It's not over engineering and those sorts of things. It's the other thing that I would call out that I've always thought was clever in the way in which uh, that worked was the choice of metrics. I, I had a bit of a debate with the Dora people about this because they were talking about adding a new metric in the last version, which I was quibbling about a little bit but i thought i thought that the that the four key metrics in stability in terms of stability and throughput were clever because they don't tell you everything that you'd like to know about software but they tell you stuff that's generic they tell you stuff that matters to everybody and that's important because not everybody's building stuff in the cloud not everybody's you know building you know the, the the same kinds of things and and so I, I think one of the failures in the past of measures is narrowing them too much into selection so so finding those general things that really that are also they're not just general but they're outcome focused you're not measuring part of the process you're measuring things that really matter you know fundamentally what's the quality of the software and what's the rate at which you can produce software at that quality but I'm, I'm a big fan yeah thank you and and um i mean and also being able to look at organizational outcomes and yeah. show that those performance outcomes for software delivery impact the organizational outcomes. Yeah. And that, that that was the other really big thing to come out of it for me is that these yeah. things actually matter and make a difference to your organization. And, and to yeah. go back to your earlier point about, you know, this discussion between developers and managers, the other thing that I thought was great about Gary Groover and what he did is, you know, he says, you know, we didn't go to, we didn't go to the product people and say, please, please, can we have permission to do testing? They just yeah. did it. Yes. They, they didn't, they didn't, you know, and I think this is a mistake that some people make is they want to be a bit too honest about it and ask permission for everything, you know, yeah. and the, the kind of the analogy that I give is, you know, you don't go to the garage to get your car fixed and then have the mechanic say, okay, I'm going to charge you this much to fix it. And then I'm going to charge you this extra amount to make sure that it works after I fixed it. <laughs> yes. Like what well, that would be stupid. <laughs> it's part of the job, you know, yes. like writing the tests to make sure the thing works after you built it is part of the job. It's not something you can or should separate out into a separate activity. You know, it, it, you know, it doesn't make sense. And I think, you know, that that's part of what it is, is like knowing what to know, knowing how to think about this and knowing how to communicate it or not to communicate it in some way. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, I, absolutely. It's, it's funny listening to you talk about this stuff because you're saying the stuff that I say all of the time, but just with different words. It's, we're clearly very, very, very close. Unsurprisingly, I suppose. Yeah, I think like, in terms of the way that we think about this stuff. I mean, I remember when we were writing the book, the, the biggest <laughs> argument we had was was over my use of semicolons. You were really trying to get rid of all my semicolons. <laughs> Yeah, and I was really that. into my semicolons. No, no, it's fine. You know, like, like, but I remember, you know, it, it was it was actually a remarkably, uh, you know, it, 
we, we had a few debates about bits and pieces yeah. here. I remember, I remember we, we, there was something we were trying to resolve around acceptance testing. But like, yeah. I, I think, you know, it would be hard to get like a Rizzler paper between us on any of the substantive oh, issues. And, uh, abso- and that's absolutely. continued to be the case, I think, throughout uh, the, the subsequent 13 years. Absolutely. I've, I've heard it said that, that the, <laughs> it is a difficult effort of writing a book with somebody else is usually enough to break the friendship. I'm, I'm delighted to say that never happened to us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, 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 so um, there's one more, one more question that, from Patreon that I wanted to ask, which I've just lost. So, um, yeah, if is there so based on the conversation, if there's anything, is there anything that you'd change if we were to rewrite the continuous delivery book or update it? Yeah, I think um, again, I mean, I think both of us feel that we we more or less got it right on all the substantive issues. I think probably the mistake that I think we made um, that I feel bad most bad about was not talking more about security. Um, yeah. and, and building security in uh, because that that's hugely important and, and one of the main benefits of, of this approach is that you can build security in as part of the other quality attributes of the software uh, and that's something we researched in the in the Dora program as well and, yeah. and showed that if you take a, a continuous approach to security that improves outcomes um, both in terms of performance and in terms of your ability to do a good job on security um, and then you know there's been a bunch of technology changes I mean much to my dismay, Maven still seems to be very commonly in use. So that's one bit we wouldn't need to change. Um, yeah. You know, I still teach this class in, in Java and I still talk to people in, in the industry and like everyone's still using Maven. And like, that's the yeah. prediction I would not have made. Uh, Nor me. Um, Nor me. Although like some of the other things we proposed have fallen along the wayside. Um, I still like Ant secretly. Um, yeah. But but I think, you know, obviously containers and the clouds um, were, were very much in their early stages when we were talking yeah. about it. So I'd have to talk a lot more about, about yeah, that. I, I think but we we, can't, we we did talk about the concept, I think, talking in terms of images, I, as I recall in the book, for to represent, you know, chunks of configured system. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because fundamentally, yeah. one thing we talked about, uh, chapter 10, if I remember rightly, was about configuring production systems and yeah. and 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 doing it the hard way basically before yeah. containers are around and, and all those same principles apply you know so the people are doing yeah. the same things we just have simpler tooling to do it um yes. and then the other thing i think probably would have been good to talk about is uh software supply chain um yeah. so how you go back into like your dependencies and and uh and make sure that those are managed effectively there's been a big debate about um the kind of google uh monolithic repo uh and yeah. blaze uh that way of working or basel i guess if you're outside google yeah. versus the kind of uh, lots of repos for lots of different things so there's like a whole bunch of other things we could talk about i probably cut the chapter on advanced version control because a lot of that just doesn't apply anymore yeah. um so i think there's there's definitely things that I, I would i would change um but fundamentally all, all the principles haven't changed uh, how about you yeah and no, I, I I agree with you. I I I I I constantly still, after all of these years, kick myself about the security omission because at the time I was in the middle of building. It was certainly, in the latter part of writing the book, I was in the middle of building the the Armax Exchange, and we were doing all of those things. I just thought it was obvious that we were, t- you know, when we were talking about test everything, we meant test everything, including any non-functional requirements you've got. So I, I was kind of talking about you know, what we were talking about, performance testing and so on in the book. And I was thinking, well, that's obviously just a placeholder for non-functional requirements. It's it's about, you know, non-functional requirements in general. And I wish we talked more about security. We did we did the some of the supply chain stuff because we were worried about being attacked as a you know an on the internet finance uh, organization. So so there are there are those sorts of things. I think the other thing that I'd be interested in is probably I, I think I'm I'm a little bit more bullish than I was in the past because we've got more evidence now, I suppose. So I, I thought we were onto something fairly good, reasonably, uh, you know, when we were writing the book. But I was also I also assumed that nobody'd read it. I was, you know, there's there's me, you, and our mates would read it. It was kind of what I assumed. You know, it might be useful to other people inside Portworx or something. I don't know. 
but but I didn't expect it to be anywhere near the success that it was. Um, so I was, you know, in order to be to appeal, I, I think there's probably some stuff that we we didn't even strongly align, very strongly align it. Obviously, with agile as it was then, we said you could use these in other in other ways of working. I don't believe that anymore. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I believed it then, but I don't say that anymore. And so I I, I think I position it more strongly as kind of an engineering discipline and certainly i as you you were talking about earlier we've got a wealth of examples now of people practicing this in all kinds of different industry circumstances technologies and so on there is no there is no form of software to which this isn't applicable to my mind isn't a better way of working to my mind so so i'd like to say that more forcefully i think if we were ever to do such a thing yeah Anyway, that's probably a good good place to stop. Jez, it's been an absolute delight to catch up with you. Um, uh, we, we we must talk again soon. Yeah, it's been a huge pleasure. I mean, uh, you know, I've got such fond memories of writing the book and uh, and working with you over the years, and it's uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to catch up again and 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 to and to stay in touch. That's, Thank that's you very great. much for having so, me on so, the show. Uh, absolutely my 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 pleasure i'd like to say thank you every to everybody for watching if you've enjoyed the content uh, hit like join in the the conversation in, in, underneath and i'm sure that jez and i will be diving in and and, and arguing with you <laughs> it's been a pleasure thank you thanks very much dave bye